All right, it looks like we're live, people. This is good. Uh, you may or may not, let me just get this framed perfectly so that I don't drive myself crazy all stream. Everybody, this is gonna be fun. This is the second live stream that I'm gonna be doing with Mike Cernovich. And I'm a little less nervous now than I was for the first one because it, it, social media world is what it is. When I first did the first live stream, I was younger, I was more uh, wet behind the ears and new to this whole social media uh, world. And it was a great live stream. The, 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 the funny thing is, uh, first of all, everyone, hello. Hope everyone's having a good day. The funny thing about that live stream is I got a lot of, compl not complaints. You know, people were saying, you spent an hour talking about Mike Cernovich personally, personal life history. I like to get to know people. I like to get to know uh, everything about them so I can assess them, you know, so I can assess them. So I can actually know them as opposed to knowing sound bites or tweets or, 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 or clips or whatever. Uh, and I think we got to know Mike. I think I got to know Mike. And now we don't have to do that. Now I know Mike. If you watched that stream, you know Mike. If you've been following Mike for a while, you already know Mike. Uh, and today um, I DM'd Mike a couple of days ago and said, you know, I, I would love to talk about the movie Hoaxed anytime because I got questions about like, you know, production, technical stuff, substantive stuff. Uh, he said, let's do it. So we're going to we're going to bring him in in a few minutes. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. If you might share and, you know, I don't know, on social retweet the link because I've been told that YouTube's notification system is um, rusty, so to speak. Uh, I am going to get to the super chats in as much as possible. I reserve the right to not get to some because it may not work with the flow. Matthew Hammond, would you would Mike consider a march on Washington D.C. or mobilize an organized an organized barrage of calls to the White House and U.S. Capitol switchboards to demand the GOP to get off their butts and bring back law and order? I'm going to ask this to Mike. Um, so that's it. That's what's on the table today. We're gonna we're gonna go with Mike. It's gonna be interesting. Bring your questions. I'm going to try to get to questions as much as I can because I think that's almost more interesting than you know my brief skeleton of an outline of the things I want to talk about with Mike. Uh, so let's do this. Without further ado, uh, two and a half minutes in, people will start you know trickling in over time as the notifications come in. I got the notification, I think. Let me see what I got there. Yeah, I got a notification. All right, bringing in Mike. He is looking good today. Where is he? At the right stream. Here. Mike, how you doing? Doing well, sir. How are you? Very good, very good. From across the country, we meet a second time. I feel like we had. I, I feel like we had three, but I guess it was only two. I think it. I uh, th no, this is our second. I think. Yeah, yeah, but I felt like it was our third. So I guess maybe we just gossip like teenagers so much that it feels like feels like we talk more than we do. Well, since since our first stream, I mean, we do DM from time to time on on Twitter, so we might know each other better than we even did after that first stream. Um, what are you smoking there, Mike? If I may, uh, if I may ask. Yeah, an Avo, an Avo 30th anniversary. It's a little, it's a little harsh. It's Nicaraguan tobacco, which I usually don't like, but you can't get um, because of coronavirus, you can't get um, Cuban tobacco. They're just so, so you have to. Um, I usually like Cohiba or something, and the Nicaraguan stuff is a little, little harsh, but we're making do. Still a good cigar. I love asking a question where I know that I'm not going to know anything of the answer because cigars are the furthest thing from my uh, repertoire. I, every every time I smoke, it's always when we're going golfing, and I always get nauseous and wretch afterwards, no matter what I do. Yeah, well, you got to get the right one. So next time you go, get like a Monte Cristo white, get something with a lighter wrapper. It's a good. It does. It doesn't always work, but if it's a lighter wrapper, then it'll be it'll be mellow. And I hear some kids upstairs asking if I'm doing my live stream. I'm doing the live stream, people. Um, yes, I'm. It's it's good. Let I'll tell you about it afterwards. Uh, I don't know how much the mic picks up. <sighs> the kids are leaving the house, so we're gonna have quiet time. Uh, so, Mike. Okay. First of all, I mean, let, not the elephant in the room. This, first and foremost, what's life like now in California under under coronavirus, under the under the protests, the riots? What's going on where you are? Well, I haven't um, haven't been to the gym in four months because gyms have been closed since March, and parks were closed. So wherever I, where I like to hike trails for for exercise, I'd like to do trails and um, gym gym bro stuff. And now I'm like walking, you know, trying to find hills in the neighborhood or something like that. So that's my biggest. That's the only real adaptation for me because I um like I don't like to leave my house anyway. 
So for me, the lockdown has just been, oh, okay, maybe I'll go get a, a coffee in the morning. So a, a general day for me would be leave my house once to get coffee, leave it once to go to the gym or to go on a hike, and then I'm home, home the rest. Except, you know, Shauna, the women, you know, they always like to do dinners out and stuff. So that's – um, I, I do that, you know, the good husband. And, okay, so, like, we're sitting in Canada. We have protests in the street which are – by and large, peaceful, minimal property damage. In Montreal, we actually had, for whatever the reason, some looting. One of the stores in downtown Montreal got looted, but by and large, nothing. Is the situation in the States like what we see it is on the media in Canada, or is it is it better or worse? Oh, no, it's worse. Yeah, yeah, definitely worse than, um, than widely reported. Unless you're on Twitter, you don't really see, like, the full scope of it. But it was, but that was confined mainly to like urban areas. So uh, a buddy of mine, I don't know if you call him a friend, but a good acquaintance. He's, um, he was just in like the nice part of Soho, and people were, you know, banging on their doors because it just became completely lawless. And he was, uh, you know, it, he still is, I think, a kind of a lefty. But it came to their front doors. It's primarily the rich people who were getting the brunt of this. There, there's been some. In some areas, you know, tragically, businesses have been destroyed and everything. But when it went off in New York, it, it's the rich people that got looted. Midtown Manhattan, that's where, you know, the money is. Uh, that was getting looted. And the looting wasn't just confined to the stores. It was all over the the neighborhoods and, and spilled over. So it's it's worse than uh, television media has been reporting it. But where where I am, it's just there's Trump flag. Like the other day I was on my, you know, trying to get some exercise in and I, was, I paused at the bottom of a hill and I looked right and I looked left Trump flags. I was like, Oh God, this is, it's too Trump. My neighborhood's too Trumpy for me. You know, it's, I'm like, Oh God. So yeah, you see a lot of American flags, a lot of Trump flags. So that kind of stuff um, doesn't, doesn't come over to this neighborhood. Yeah. So I mean, that, that's sort of like the, the protective bubble. If you stay, is, is it the case? If you stay out of the areas, you'll avoid problems or do the problems trickle into areas where there were no problems prior well, that's what happened in the urban environment that's what happened to my um, acquaintance in new york is they were it just they were in an area that wasn't targeted per se but if if there are you know thousand people out doing you know looting and rioting and stuff like that you're going to get a few dozen here or there in the neighborhoods that you wouldn't expect it to so primarily it was again um it was hurting urban rich white liberals is who bore the brunt of this kind of stuff. Actually. So this is an interesting thought that I'm having. I mean, you on Twitter, we know your niche. We know, say your persona. What's your uh, feel in the, on the other side, like say the leftists, the liberals, the liberals in terms of like the overall pulse of them. And are they turning more call it center, which might be more to the right than people are appreciating from what's being reported on the media. Is there like a whole, shift in the tide of people who were once left and now are seeing that maybe that they don't like it there. Oh, there were some polls that came out and the, the, I don't agree with this, but it was 50, I think either 51 or 58% of people want military action for the riots. 48% of Democrats wanted it and 78% wanted the national guard. So the people are more radicalized than I am because people have this perception of me as, some kind of like militant dude, but it just couldn't be further from the truth. I'm just a leave me alone. I'm militant only and just leave me alone kind of dude. And the, yeah, the public's getting radicalized in a, in a major way. Unfortunately for Trump, he's has been unable to capitalize on that, but the mood has, the mood has changed for sure. Uh, and now changed, uh, radicalized. That's the thing is like people, they say both sides are getting more radicalized, but is there, I would, I would assume that the right, get, there's going to be very few people migrating from the right to the left based on what they're seeing, but... Oh, no, zero. No, it's all net gain, net gain to the right for sure. Because it's an interesting thing. Also in Canada, we don't have these the same problems, uh, but we did have a poll that showed like the majority of people want, you know, a, a substantial amount of people wanted martial law or would support the idea of martial law to keep the peace in the streets, but not in response to the same crisis that you have in the States now. So it wouldn't be representative of the same shift from the left to the right. It would just be a sign of people on the left wanting, you know, military presence in the streets to assure peace and order and law and order. And the right, you know, we don't really have, uh, 
we don't have that type of right in Canada, the the, the bearing arms right. But um, so that's interesting. And, and do you think we're going to see an impact of this in the 2020 vote? Is this a big silent majority or is this not going to have much of an impact on the election? Well, yeah, I mean, it, Trump is just completely dropping the ball. So it's hard for me. It's hard for me to predict. So right now, it's in, we're in such an era of uncertainty, too, because we're dealing with this struggle session culture now where anything you say that even would be kind of innocuous. So, for example, someone got fired. Uh, Shauna came home mad. She's not a political person. And one of the reality shows that she watches, one of the women got fired. And here's what she said. When there was an outcry about no um, black filmmakers nominated for the Oscars, she said, well, maybe they didn't make films as good as everyone else. That was it that year. She didn't say they can't make films. She didn't say people of color can't make films. She just said, well, maybe they just didn't make, you know, any great films that year that were deserving of the Oscars. Canceled. Done. Done so. So even anything that contradicts a guy, um, this is quite startling, actually, uh, a, a, a Mexican immigrant worked for PG&E, that's the, the power company in California, and he drove through a protest and he had his hand outside of his car and he was like cracking his knuckles. And apparently when he cracked his knuckles, it appeared that he made the OK sign, which was then interpreted as a white power sign. So he got blasted on Twitter, reported to PG&E, and then fired for making a white power sign when he was cracking his knuckles, you know, because you crack your knuckles like this. Yep. I mean, it's just, it's just it's the, that right. It's just completely moronic. And he got fired. And the, even the person who got him fired goes, well, maybe, uh, you know, I wish that ha didn't happen, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, good luck. The guy just lost his job. So because of this struggle session culture we're in, this year zero Pol Pot kind of thinking, people aren't going to even tell the truth on a poll. So all these polls are like, well, Trump is down. This Trump is on that. I, I can't trust any polling coming out now because people are really in a state of terror. I mean, I, the thing is, I've never trusted the polling, period, before before anything even in Canadian elections. I just don't trust the polling because it, it's like you're relying on a small sample of people to be honest in the questionnaire when sometimes being honest is not popular, even if it's anonymous. Um, and you get a thousand people, like even that, that poll that led to, you know, led to Jenna Ellis on CNN fighting with Stelter, um, yeah. They only told, they only pulled twelve hundred and fifty people, and then they make you know these broad predictions about, about across the country. It's they're fundamentally flawed in general, but I would imagine especially so now. It's just a question of people who live on social media might have a different feel for the actual sentiment than these pollsters who measure twelve hundred people who might happen to answer their phone on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, I hadn't. I see. I, I heard the story about the guy getting fired for that. I I had to chalk it up to exaggeration and I don't like to retweet retweet stories unless I've you know personally vetted them because oftentimes things are out of context but so this this who who took the picture what's what happened with this Did somebody took a picture of him cracking his knuckles yeah so he had his hand out the window which is a common way to drive in the US I don't know how you do in Canada <laughs> so for me it just he had his hand out the window and he was cracking his knuckles you know cruising you know cruising with one hand at 12 12 o'clock driving cracking his hands out the window and then that became he was making a white power gesture to taunt Black Lives Matter protesters. And and remember, we had this hysteria with West Point. They were playing the circle game. So this during the Army Navy game, a few cadets were like, you know, playing the circle game, which is, you know, they're 19. That's why people are like, well, that was immature. It's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm surprised that teenage teenagers on camera were were acting like teenagers on can't believe, you know, can't believe they would do that. And what's unfortunate is that, like, I know now that I can't make an OK sign. It's just a completely dumb rule that I have to follow because I know how to be used against me. But unless you live in this world, the OK sign is a scuba sign in the in the um, in scuba training. When when your scuba instructor is like, "Is everything OK?" You make the OK sign to let them know that your mask is on and your oxygen is good, or your air tank is good. And so, unless you live in this world, you have no idea that you're now making you know, white supremacy symbols, but that doesn't save you. It doesn't matter because we, we're in an era, again, of mass hysteria of, I use the term struggle session advisedly. We saw this happen in uh, Maoist China where the students would round up professors and hail them out in public and draw them out in public and make them confess to their colonialism and, 
imperialism and everything else that they were evil of doing. And you had to just go on these hour long struggle sessions to hope to hope you would do it. And here they can't do that because the people that they would do that to are the people who have the second amendment, but they can ruin a lot of innocent people and cause a lot of innocent people to lose their jobs. It's interesting. Actually, I mean, um, I'll just pull this up. Keep fighting mandatory carry. Thank you. Um, you, you've read John Ronson, so you've been publicly shamed. Mm-hmm. So, and, and if I can share this with, with, the, with the rest of the world, I DM'd uh, Mike after I read that book because there was a part in it that sort of struck me as being particularly relevant to our first stream, um, which was that the people doing the shaming, this is from the book, says, you know, the people doing the shaming on the one hand are doing it to virtue signal their own their own sanctity on, on social media and the harder they, you know, dump on somebody else, the more holy they are. And on the other hand, you know, John Ronson said one of the conclusions was they're not doing it because they want you to apologize so they can accept your apology. They're doing it so they can silence you. And he used a more, you know, he says they want to kill you because they don't want you to talk. They want to then talk for you and define you because you have been silenced. And that's the ultimate purpose of all of this, which in retrospect, given what our discussion was for the first 30 minutes of our stream, I could appreciate that all the more in hindsight. Not that I think it's the way it should be uh, and not that I would live to that standard, but you know, it, it was insightful in that it's an inauthentic, um, it's an inauthentic pylon because it's not done actually to punish any crime justly. It's not even done to punish a crime. It's done to, on the one hand, virtue signal, and on the other hand, silence an adversary, which is why I find it's always tactically used. There was there was a picture of AOC doing the okay hand gesture. No one's going to use that. No one's going to what's the word? Weaponize that against her. Nobody has the incentive. It might be more or less plausible, but you know, other people when they catch a uh, still frame, they're going to do it. So, well, and the OK sign too, and they, these reporters, they all know this because I did it as a joke on Jay Z. I started the whole thing with Jay Z and Beyonce because they would make it, and people were like, "Oh, that was like Illuminati." So it was really like their whole semiotics lecture is based on a faulty premise because. It was making fun of Jay-Z and Beyonce and that like the Baphomet symbolism that they use and the Illuminati symbolism they use. And I think we talked about this in the last stream where there's even a video on YouTube where somebody claimed that I was making a satanic 666 gesture because the OK symbol looks like the letter six. So they're like, why is Cernovich using the 66? Which I was like, well, that's a new one on me. I didn't even, you know, so, so now I'm caught in the world where like, OK, I, I thought we were making fun of Jay-Z and Beyonce. And being like Illuminati and, and kind of dunking on them a little bit. But then it becomes, no, no, it's a 666 thing. And I'm like, okay. And then now they're like, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a racial thing and everything else. And, and by the way, the fact that we're having this conversation is completely moronic. And it's a sign of the times that, that this has to, that we have to go into all this exegesis and elaboration on a completely innocuous symbol because it's been memed by the left is a way to weaponize people because the way it works. And, and this is, you know, as a, as a lawyer, you learn this, you, if you want maximum power for yourself and you truly want to have the rule of man and not the rule of law is you make everything a crime, but you only selectively prosecute your adversaries. So you take something. Okay. The okay sign, you, there's probably 5 million people in America who have a picture of themselves in an okay sign, but you pretend like it is not, done innocuously and they're like oh we want to take that guy out oh here he is 2017 making this okay sign clearly this is a a white supremacist okay we'll go to cancel him that's that's how you want it so you're you're you criminalize innocuous behavior so that you can selectively enforce the law against people that you don't like and it was even even said during the time of stalin and and this happened in colombia too more recently with the cartels if you didn't like your neighbor you would call the Columbia secret police and say, oh, I, I saw Pablo Escobar was at my neighbor's house. And that's how people would settle grudges that aren't even ideological is, oh, there, that guy there, you know, he's talking against communism in Stalin's era. So the next thing you know, the, the Stasi's on the guy. You don't like somebody in your Columbia. Oh, yeah, Pablo Escobar, we just saw him there. He was just in and out of there. Now the people's house is getting torn down and raided. That That's what we're doing. We've, we've given immense power to the most base human instincts and base human impulses. No, I mean, incidentally, it, it, we, we've seen it. Uh, it. It's the rule on social media of how to, you know, how to demonize your adversary. It's the rule in the law that we're seeing now with, we'll get into it. It's a good time. Roger Stone and um, 
uh, holy cow, his name just left me. Um, Michael Flynn, sorry. Uh, prosecuting and conviction for these crimes, lying to an investigator, lying during an investigation where we can name six other people who have done the exact same thing under different circumstances who don't get prosecuted. And so both either are both, both are illegal or both are not illegal. But right now we say both are illegal, except we only go after the ones we want to go after and, uh, you know, exonerate or don't pursue the ones we don't want to pursue. So it's the same, same reason why, I mean, I'm noticing some people get away with histories of dressing up as other races and others don't. Um, Sarah Silverman, Howard Stern, most recently, Jimmy Kimmel, whereas on the other side of the spectrum, the, you know, people go after them and ruin their livelihoods as a result of it. Um, speaking of which, actually, so for anybody who doesn't know, can we get into, we'll get into uh, Roger Stone, Tamika Hart, the amic or the, the motion you filed? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. For anybody who doesn't know, first of all, anybody who doesn't know that Mike was involved in filing a motion to unseal certain documents in the Epstein file. We talked about that. That was, you know, the bulk of the second half of our stream the last time. Recently has done the same thing in the uh, Roger Stone file, where when it became disclosed that the jury four person, Tamika Hart, after conviction, had a whole social media history that that might reek of a certain political bias. And once that all became clear, you know, the social media posts came to the fore. Roger Stone made a motion uh, for a retrial, which was and a motion to recuse the judge, both of which were, were dismissed. Mike uh, made a motion to unseal documents so that we could, I think, I think the object of it was so you could see the answers to the questions by the by the um, jury members, but specifically one question in particular by Tamika Hart. Yeah, there. Um, right. So that's interesting um, because the the backstory of that was. I filed yeah, a motion to obtain her answers, the jury for woman's answers, because she outed herself to CNN. She, she posted uh, a Facebook post saying, I can't believe that the prosecutors and Roger Stone are being called names. I was a jury for woman and he was guilty. And then I was like, oh, okay. And then Josh Gerstein, uh, a politico, tweeted out that she had run for Congress. And then I was like, oh, oh, I wonder what that is about. And then I was like, oh, that's her Twitter account. Okay, because you're always afraid you have the wrong person's account, right? That's like my biggest, like, okay, Tamika Hart, Memphis. How many Tamika Hearts are there in Memphis with a verified account? But you're like, you just, because you're a lawyer, you have that paranoia always in the background that you're, because you've seen other people do it. You've watched people walk the plank for themselves. And you're just like, yeah, yeah, keep walking. Yeah, yeah, great, great points you're making there. Keep doing it. Ah, oh, they fall off a cliff. So I, I have that ingrained fear. And then, and then, like, okay, so we got her. It's good to go. And I mean, yeah, I mean, she called Trump the KKK. Said she walked by the Trump Hotel and like screamed at it. Just really, like, the kind of things that if you were, <laughs> if you were on trial and you're affiliated with Trump, not only affiliated with Trump, but his chief advisor at one point. This is not the person who should ever be on your jury. So, for me, I just thought it was journalistically interesting and relevant to find out. What were her other answers? Did she answer truthfully? The press has a right to know. Now that motion has been kind of buried, and here's why it's been kind of buried. So after I filed my motion to, because it's not really an intervene and unseal because it's a criminal thing, so the there's no real procedure for it. Actually, it's a common law access uh, right of access to records. So it's a little little quirkier um, legalese. But after I filed my motion. The Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press filed an amicus brief on behalf of 20 or 21 media organizations, including the New York Times, which said not only should Cernovich be able to get the records he sought, he didn't ask for enough, and we want everything. We want the whole the whole everything. So I, I, I kept it very limited because I didn't want the judge to just say, oh, this is just some troll who likes Trump and is trying to harass someone and what a bully. and so, so I was like, I got to be very careful, narrowly tailor my, my application. And then now you have the New York Times and I think the Washington Post to Fox News, every, it's just bipartisan saying, no, no, like the law is pretty clear on this. He has a right to this information. And so the judge is doing what judges do when they know that they have to rule on your favor. They just don't issue a ruling at all. And that's where we're completely stalled out.
And now I, I had asked Robert Barnes this in certain contexts. Does the judge have um, a time frame within which they are procedurally no. required? No, they can sit on it for two years. That's crazy. So it, it, you get the, did you get the impression that uh, if, in as much as the media hates you, well, as, in as much as they publicly claim to hate you, do you get the impression that they like you in the sense that they use you sort of like a journalistic, for lack of a better word, the journalistic goon who's going to go do the work that they don't want to do in terms of trying to get information on someone who's on the left that might make the left look bad. They don't want to do it themselves. So once they see you do it, they let you go ahead first and then they sort of piggyback on you. I'm a useful tool. Um, yeah, I'm certainly a useful tool because you don't want to be, if you're the New York times, you don't want to be the person filing the lawsuit for the Roger Stone records, right? Cause that's how you're going to lose subscribers. But if I filed it, then you go through a, a third party, the reporters committee for freedom of press, who, by the way, they backed me in the Epstein case also. And then you're like, well, you know, we're just, it, it, there's a case out there and this group filed it. So it's almost like laundering, right? They're, they're laundering, they're laundering their journalism through me because I, I take the hits, I take the attacks. And then this other group files an amicus. So they're technically not a party to the case. They're just saying that it would be helpful for the, for them to help the court. And yeah, that's why, again, that's why the, the judge is um, slow walking it. Because it's not particularly a difficult case. In fact, when news broke that I had filed my motion, uh, to their discredit, including Brad Heath, he's a actually quite intelligent legal reporter, they tried to act like what I was asking for was unprecedented, but it's just not. The, the, this had come up at the Barry Bonds jury questionnaire. This had, it had come up many times before and been litigated before. It was not an issue of first impression. It's actually a pretty straightforward uh, it's a pretty straightforward legal issue, as it was in Epstein. And the judge and the Epstein thing also slow walked it. Like we filed it, and he took his, you know, he, he delayed as much as he could. Then he denied it, and then he was reversed by the Second Circuit. So we have a similar dynamic here, where the law is on my side. The judge doesn't want to give me a win, and rather than give me a loss, knowing that I'll appeal it, and then the judge will be dismissed. In embarrassing fashion on appeal, the judge is go just going to slow walk it, and in theory, they don't they just never have to, have to rule. I don't because I don't have rights as a litigant. If I were a criminal defendant, like you have certain rights, I don't have rights as a litigant to demand any kind of speedy trial rights or any kind of deadline. So yeah, the judge can can take her time and do whatever she wants with it. And I'm a bit of an idiot because I'm thinking as to how the judge rendered her decision on the motion for a retrial when this information was not disclosed as per your motion. But this is documentation that's already in the hands of the party. So it's not like they are their rights are being prejudiced because they already have that information at hand. Exactly. Exactly. Mike, I'm going to read. I want to read some of the super chats that I've been screenshotting while we go. Someone asked, would Mike consider a march on Washington, D.C. or mobilize an organized barrage of calls to the White House and U.S. Capitol switchboards to demand the GOP to get off their butts and back law and order? Um, it's not really my bag, you know. Um, I don't I can't. And, and this goes back to being, you know, framed for stuff is if, if I do that then I would get some kind of – sorry, I'm fixing my mic here. Go on, go if, I, if I did that, then I would get some kind of bad actor doing some shenanigans, and then the story would be, oh, yeah, this guy likes Mike Cernovich, and look at what he did, and then it would be kind of like used to attack me. So in, in a way, that's how the media sidelines people is it doesn't matter if you're like the most clean-cut guy in the world and you don't really do anything wrong. If they can frame you via guilt by association, which, by the way, they never do the left, right? It's just it's just the way the way of the world. So yeah, if I did something like that, it, I would just be you know it would be it wouldn't it wouldn't end well for me or for the for the underlying um, the underlying I would say grievance. Yeah, and you'd you'd get blamed in the same way you got blamed for the first chapter of the movie Hoaxed, which we'll get into. Yeah. Uh, let me. I'll just, I'll just blitz through these. Viva, did your old YouTube squirrel video get an uptick after the Netflix appearance? No, uh, no, nothing noticeable. It was that that video is already saturated the internet market for squirrel stealing GoPro videos. Uh, then we got Zex who says, this happened in the US 100 years ago, including bombings. Solution was deporting socialists, even US citizens. President can do it through new executive powers. Um, what do we got here? Scott Range, thanks for doing a stream in my bedtime for the Europeans. Yeah, it's, it's more reasonable than 9.30 at night. And then we got uh, Mr. Rover Pilot. This is going to be for you, Mike. Do you think that 
it's even possible for Trump to do anything right now. I think it was designed so that if Trump does anything at all to shut down the violence, he'll be attacked and as causing the problem. Yeah, uh, yeah the, I don't find that argument persuasive. So the the argument is, well, Trump isn't, I say Trump is anything doing anything. People go, well, what do you want him to do? Do you want him to send in the guard, the military? And I was like, well, I didn't say that. What Trump is not doing is he's not providing more leadership. He's not pro providing morale, right? Read what General Patton had to say about morale. Other than you know having the supplies that you need in the training, is your morale. You you have to show your face when you're under attack, as he was um, early on in the riots. You as a leader of the strongest country supposedly in the world, you don't get to hide out. You don't get to just lay low. You need to show your face from the Oval Office, just like FDR did the fireside chats. The fireside chats. What did they do? They provided leadership, moral leadership for people. They provided messaging for people. They calmed people. That's your job as a leader. And yeah, I don't want Trump sitting in the army. That's when people, that's why, that's like when people, and that wasn't your comment or saying that, but that's the idea with online. They're like, oh, you just want the military to go in and shoot people so we can have another Kent State event. Where did I say that actually? I actually said the opposite. I said that polling says the public wants the military. 48% of Democrats want the military. I don't. That's too radical for me. But that shows you the mood of the room <laughs> is we want the military. So then what you do as a leader is you say, you know, I know a lot of you people want the military to be brought in, but we don't, you know, you just tell them we don't use the military on domestic actions like that. But the fact that it's gotten so lawless and violent is because of, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then you can point the fingers at Democrats and the media, not just from a, twi a tweet, but they, you have to show your face. You have to show your face because, you, you, you know, people are always like, oh, you're rattled or this. I'm like, I'm on video all the time, right? You just, you can't say that. It's, it's not a believable image. So that's what you have to do. You have to provide more leadership, moral guidance. And then people go, oh, whatever Trump does, the media is going to attack him. Oh, big surprise. I mean, what is that? How is that even a persuasive point? Like, oh, you mean he's going to get attacked by the media? Again, wow. That So if he does nothing, he clearly won't be attacked by the media, right? Who cares? The idea of this, this just thinking is, and this is why Trump won the election is why he's losing now, is the messaging is you just go. You just go. If I'm – like right now if I were trending on the internet because I'm the evil person, the worst person in the world, whatever random thing, I don't just tweet. I'm going to show them on video like I'm going to take all your bullets. I'm going to take all the hits. I'm going to take all the attacks, and I'm going to keep pushing forward. That's what you have to do in messaging, and that's what Trump did in 2015, 2016, and is what he's not doing now. And it could be he has health problems. There's that West Point, um, you know, walk that's a little, a little disturbing, and some other issues that that may explain his absence. But no, no, no. In times of crisis, the same thing happened when there was that. Remember that big oil spill, 10, Exxon, 15 years ago. Exxon Valdez. No, no, it was after Exxon Valdez. I think it was a British company. But oh, the, the, uh, uh, off the coast of Florida. Yeah. So the CEO, you know, what, all, all, he was there every day doing a good job. But then what cost him is he took a day off and he was like, well, why can't I take a day off? You know, I've been working eight, 18 days straight or whatever. And, he, you know, you lost the plot. As a leader, you don't you don't get to do that. Sorry, uh, your president. And I don't feel bad for him. I don't feel bad for people who actively seek a leadership position and then find out. Yeah, now you got to step up. You got to show your face. You got to set the messaging. You got to set the set the agenda. You have to push everything forward. And he hasn't done that in his poor leadership. I, I mean, this is not my idea. I just I see both sides on the on social media. But what about the idea that, or the 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 strategy that he's allowing it to happen so that people can get mad at the left's inaction or inability to properly respond? So then he can you know I guess come in at some point in the future and be the savior or be the hero. Or just let, or just let one side eat itself. Yeah, I addressed that a little flippantly on Twitter, so I'll be flipped first, and then I'll elaborate more. Which was, yeah, what you do is you let the city, you let the enemy army destroy the country, and then you go see. Imagine how bad it's going to be if you don't vote for me in 2020. Just think of how much worse it could be. That's not persuasive. That's not leadership. That isn't where people think. Yeah, you're right. It, I mean, my business is gone, but I mean, my life's completely upended and destroyed. But phew, my, it'll probably be even worse if Biden, you know, Biden does it, you know, probably. 
that's just completely – when people say things like that, I'm like, okay, you've never led men. You've never led people in any kind of organization where you could be fired – because there's a difference, like some middle manager, there's buck passing, people work in these bureaucracies. Well, I don't know who did. That's his department. There is no Trump saying, you know, the, the line that the buck stops here, right? Truman, I think, was said that. There is no, oh, there's some other department. They, you're the leader of the free world. You are the leader of the most powerful nation in the world. You don't get to say, yeah, we're going to let all this terrorism and bombs and riots happen, and that's fine. And we'll just let them destroy themselves. And then I'll come in at the end at the 11th hour and say, boy, don't you whoosh. No. And in every movie, by the way, imagine – because that's what I tell people because we think in terms of story. We think in terms of film. That's how our brains are hardwired. Imagine you're watching a movie, and the very final act of the movie is the hero comes in and says, you need me because it will be worse next time. How would you feel – about that kind of movie. You would think that's absurd. You, that movie would never get produced. That would be like a, a farce movie. That'd be like Spaceballs or or something making fun of it. The the hero the hero has to come in before all the chaos happens. And then the hero, you could come at the 11th hour, but then you have to completely turn it around. You don't get to come in at 11.59 when everything's destroyed and say, see, this is why you need me at 1 a.m. because it's just gonna be worse if we let them have their way. So no, it's, it's terrible persuasion. And if people can't understand intuitively why that's bad persuasion, just imagine you write a book and that's the last page. And then after the land had been destroyed and the enemy army had wet its beak, the hero came in and said, it'll be worse next time. <laughs> you know I mean? Fair enough. Um, it was okay. So we got Mr. Robert Pilot says it was a setup damned if you do, damned if you don't. He can only urge governors to take action, which is actually the question that I was going to get into. What about the argument that it's a state? These are state issues. Nobody wants to see the Fed step in and overstep the bounds on state independence. I mean, I hear people saying that a lot as well. Yeah, we have we saw this with Waco. I mean, this is uh, completely unpersuasive. Waco, the ATF was there. There's gun running happening right now in the Seattle Jazz there. You can watch um, weapons being distributed to people without a background check, just here you go, here's your gun. We're like the new civilian police squad. That's a, that's a federal ATF issue. So the, the, the idea that Trump has no power is actually just not, it's counter the law. It's just, that's why like sometimes I'm like, he, he just has the power under, under federal firearms regulations, for example, that's gun running, that's gun running happening. There are a lot of ways that you can incentivize people. You can just say, well, that's fine. No FEMA funds for uh, Washington. Right. That's what I would say if I were Trump. People are like, what would you do if you were Trump? Real simple. I would just say in my daily or nightly briefings to the nation, I would say that the mayor of Seattle has said that she wants her town to be lawless. The governor of Seattle or the governor of Washington has agreed that they should allow anarchists and domestic terrorists to take over their state. I believe that the voters of Washington are entitled to the representative democracy that they participate in. So what I'm doing is I will withhold all federal funds because I don't want to meddle in their affairs. So they will not receive any FEMA funds. They will not re uh, receive any kind of federal emergency relief funds. And I will respect their process. You'd get a call. The governor would call you. The minute you hang up, the governor would be crying. You can't do that. Yeah, sure I can. And then you tell the governor, sure, I yeah, I can. I mean, I completely have the power to do this it would be lunacy, right? They would be freaking out because now you're making them, you're making them, how do you say, you're making them walk the talk. This is what you want. I don't want to meddle. You know, I don't want to meddle, but if you're going to destroy your own, own, own country or destroy your own state, you can't then come to us and say, oh yeah, you can't stop us from letting terrorists destroy our city, but you have to give us money after they do. Sorry, Charlie. Did, but didn't uh, Trump make a similar threat with the sanctuary cities and withholding federal funds for has he ever, has he ever done that? You know, what's, what's he ever come through? And it's kind of like this vague thing. And that's also too with like messaging, messaging. You have to be on message every day. Imagine you, you go, you're going to go to trial and you have a great opening argument. And then like the next day you don't show up and you're like, well, I mean, it's a three week trial. You know, I don't, I don't need to be here. You know, I, I gave a great opening statement and, yeah, I'm not going to cross-examine these witnesses because, hey, you know, we don't really need to do that to win. You just, no, 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 we'll be fine. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll give a good closing argument and I'll, you know, I'll do a good cross. 
people would say, wow, that's malpractice. Why? Because you're a leader of your own little army right there, your, your information army. You have to be there every day for messaging. You know that you know the kind of car you drive in might impact the jury if you're asking for a lot of money for a client and they see you with a Mercedes. You might just lose your case because they see you walk into a Mercedes and they're like, oh, great. This guy's just going to get money off of us and I can barely pay my bills. Every Everything matters. Optics matter. Every little thing that you do matters. I know some trial lawyers, they won't have water at the, the counsel table because the jurors don't get to drink water. And then they'll say, you know, your honor, um, I would like to have a break of water. Could maybe the jury have a break of water? too like i just don't think it's right for me to drink water buddy every little sh and, and that shit all matters by the way every little thing matters and that's how you have to think of things as the leader of the free world every little thing you say and do matters everything you do is going to be scrutinized so you have to optimize your messaging the way you look your approach and again none of this is new hat to trump this is why trump won in 2015 2016 you ever seen trump in a sweatshirt right you, you ever see him not looking with the presidential uniform, the certain way, certain color flag done a certain way. You've ne he understands visual persuasion, but then forgot every lesson that he used his entire life in the past six months. I, I, I know that some people are going to be saying, you know, the, the 3D, 4D, 5D chess, and people are going to be saying, there's some, he, it's for a reason. It's almost like, I mean, I've seen it on the internet. It's almost uh religious in the sense that whatever whatever he does even if it happens to be a mistake there's some positive purpose or there's some underlying chess strategy to that so i, I know a lot of people are going to be saying that even to what you're saying right now but it's all i mean it's so that a, reminds me yeah because and it is religious thinking because i remember i grew up very religious and the the ultimate line in in most religious traditions is that the more you're pu the more that you're persecuted the more right you are because they weren't wouldn't persecute you if you're right and that's this great stopgap for any kind of criticism of your religious beliefs, right? Like, well, I believe in him, and my, my books say that I'll be mocked for believing in him. So therefore, if I'm being mocked, that's proof that he's real. And that's what that's where we are in Trump world. It's just theological style thinking. It's bad theology because we can empirically verify things that have or hadn't happened. So we don't need a supernatural explanation for Trump. But that's the line. Oh, yeah. Every, like, so, for example, the Supreme Court issued a ruling today in DACA. And there's a way that I could make a lot of hay if I were – and thank God I'm not in the White House. This is not a picture meeting in the White House. But there's a lot of hay you can make out of this DACA ruling. So when I tweeted out, like, oh, yeah, under this DACA ruling, it's giving a lot of power to the presidency, people are saying, see, he wanted to lose the court case. Because then he knew that he would get more power under this ruling. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not how it works. You would have asserted your power and had the court had the challenges for your power assertion. So even when he loses, they're like, yeah, the, that loss was all part of the plan. He wanted to lose this all along because now he has all this executive power. But then when he doesn't act. When no. Tell me we're not losing Mike. Hey, Mike, can you hear me still? Okay, hold on. I hope everyone can hear me. Can everyone still see me in the in the comment? Okay, he was cut off. Yeah, let's see. I'm going to try to take him out. I'm going to DM him and um, hopefully bring him back. Give me one second here. In the meantime, I can answer some super chats if you can still hear me. We got cut off, comma. Try to link back in, period. I will answer some super chats in the meantime. Smiley face. Okay, I hope uh, I hope we're gonna get Mike back in while he does it. He, he, I saw him; he just got pulled out of the out of the back room here with me, so he should come back soon. Rover pilot, outstanding. If I were Trump, response: I missed someone's uh, Mr. Rover pilot. No, I think I missed something here. Pretty sure I did. Let's see if I can get get him back in. Um, okay, well, anyways, well, look. Well, so let's take advantage of this time. I'm gonna get uh, read some non super chat questions. Um. Trump has spoken several times during this time, but the mass media has not been showing it. They are saying he's hiding while they suppress his roundtables and speeches, same as COVID briefings. Um, Trump is forcing our admiration. Let's see what we got here. Let's see if Mike's going to get back in. Let me know if there's a problem with connection. Okay. 
Um, oh, and let's see what we got here. So, well, until Mike gets back in, hopefully, he, hopefully, he we're able to get him back in because I want to talk about the documentary hoaxed. It's an interesting thing, actually, the idea of messaging and always having to be on message. It's the social media people. We sort of, I, I don't know, my on brand or on messaging, but it is an idea that even our prime minister, who has been holed up in his house for the last few months, nonetheless has been doing these daily briefs, and they go on Twitter and and they go on YouTube. Um, so even in his hiding, he has been making appearances and then appearances at protests. But some people like it; other people, you know, use it to criticize him. I think I see Mike back in. Add to stream. Okay, Mike. Yep. Audio. Oh. Okay, let me see if I say something again. I'll see if I can hear you. Okay, there's going to be some lag. Uh, where were we? We were on the messaging and the, oh, the, relig the religious ideology, I think. Yeah, yeah, the, just the idea that anything Trump does is part of his plan, no matter how catastrophic or disastrous. It's all part of the plan. All part of the plan. He lost the court case he wanted to lose because... Now he has this power, supposedly, that he's not going to use. Okay, now this might be a good time to get into. Um, do we do? Do we get into hoaxed? Yeah. That's okay. Good. I got. I got too many questions. For anybody who hasn't seen hoaxed, uh, first of all, this is this is like this this impression out there. I mean, again, it's it's weaponizing social media as though if you say something is good, it means you agree with all of it, and it pigeonholes you to one extreme or the other. Hoaxed is great. It's great. I watched it thoroughly. I actually watched it once and a half. Um, it's great. It's compelling. It's nuanced. I actually am surprised it got uh, what happened to it happened because it's almost optimistic at the end. The 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 for anybody who hasn't seen it, there are multiple stories. It covers multiple fake stories or you know stories which were misrepresented in the media. Um, it's got Scott Adams, Tim Pool, Jordan Peterson, uh, McInnes. Who else? I don't want to miss anybody. Uh, Laura Southern, the woman who wrote the Red Pill. I forget her name now. I always forget her name. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it, it's got. A, I mean, a, 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 a very wide range of, of people shedding their insights. There's also this underlying story of, of the BLM story and how there's something of a coming together at the end of the movie. And it's a great documentary, even if you don't agree with all of it, even if you have issues with some of it. It's eye opening. Um, so if you haven't seen it see it but now the question is this mike it's no longer available on amazon yeah amazon pulled it without explanation other than the, other than they told our distributor that the issue is not technical and that's all we're going to tell you um there's no i mean is it like i guess it's like youtube monetization where there's a ruling and there's no further there's no further explanation exactly exactly so someone's asking now actually mr Rolf, how do we watch hope how does anybody watch it now well, you, it's still on Vudu and iTunes and Google, uh, YouTube. It's, it's everywhere but Amazon. And our theory is that because there was a bit in there about Jeff Bezos and his contract with the CIA, because when we made the film, I was literally like, I'm making an above board crossover film. You can be a left winger who hates me and be like, yep, made some good points, made some good points in here. You know, I, that was literally going in my approaches. I don't do boring uh, caricatures in film. Films take too much work to to denigrate yourself and debase yourself in that way. So we we think there it was a line in there about Bezos and Amazon CIA contract that that got it pulled from Amazon. I mean, you don't have to be what they call a conspiracy theorist. It's just obviously, I mean, it's it's just obvious. It's intuitive. You're not going to get the guy who you're accusing of manipulating the media to freely and willingly not just put it up there for people to get, but actually so that the person who made it can make money off of exposing his ties to the media. I mean, for anybody who doesn't know that, that Was Bezos owns Washington Post, Bezos gets hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts from, from the CIA. It, 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 and once, you know, the, the documentary is there and it's, once it starts trending, then it gets pulled. And, you know, it, the Freedom of Speech private company, you can, still, you can still sell it elsewhere and you can still make it accessible elsewhere, but you're losing arguably the biggest platform where you get to sell your your work uh yeah it, and it was it was the number one trending documentary on amazon no it was and we got a preliminary amazon numbers and they were like way higher than i thought it would be so we we probably would have done 
several hundred thousand units just on Amazon alone. It was because people started messaging me. Oh man, you're, you're you know when I sign on to Amazon Video, Hoax is like it was number one documentary, and then it was in the top ten of all recommendations. So we the algorithm like we broke the algorithm, and th so they're like, okay, this is you know if it hadn't done so well, they probably would have left it on just to avoid the headache, but they had to make that choice. Like, okay, this is a little too far. And, and the irony, I think it was AJ in the movie talking about Operation Mockingbird, right? Which and yep. everybody doesn't know what Operation Mockingbird is. It, it's about intelligence agencies using the manipu using the media, infiltrating the media, but less sinister, buying the media to promote the message that intelligence agencies want them to promote. And right. It's one of the bigger problems we have in Canada with the CBC, which is our Canadian or Canada, it's Canadian Broadcasting Company or Canada Broadcasting Company, whatever. You know, they are funded by the federal government. It's not conspiracy and it's not, it's nothing but intuitive logic. You don't bite the hand that feeds you, especially that feeds you hundreds of millions of dollars. You may ignore the bad stories, but you're sure as heck not going to, to uh, put them on a pedestal. You're not going to promote them. So it's not, you know, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's just, Politics, call it politics or call it corruption, because those two words, I think those are two sides of the same coin. Um, so when I heard that, I mean, it's it's I, I can't get it on. I can't I, I can see it on um, Amazon, but it says it's not available in my region. Um, did it you, you're I mean, not to be cynical and everyone is entitled to make money from their work. No, but you're still able to monetize this documentary on other platforms. Oh, it, so it got banned from Amazon. Yeah, yeah. It's still on every it's still on every platform. Yeah. Because we used a real distributor. They're like the films that you we you it was a um an apolitical um dis distribution house that used to be owned by Sony. These are real guys. They'd never seen anything like it. Because when I was like, hey, you know, Amazon isn't showing up on or hoax isn't showing up on Amazon when I run a search for it, they go, Oh, it's just probably a glitch. And I was like, okay, I, I think it's probably not. But <laughs> And they probably called you a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> they're like, no, no, you know, these things happen. They've never seen anything like it before. Yeah, they, they didn't even know how to handle it. They were just like, this is beyond anything that, you know, there, there are David Icke documentaries. There are Jeepers Creepers, which a convicted pedophile has made, is on Amazon. Like, it's like there's no justification for banning hoax at all if you're applying any kind of rules. It's like, well, let's just say I'm a bad person. Okay. Mike Cernovich, bad person, evil person. Okay. So you're going to take off Jeepers Creepers made by a convicted pedophile, which I would say is pretty bad than a guy who's made some tasteless jokes here and there on the interwebs. Uh, are you going to pull every book by Harvey Weinstein, who's now a uh, convicted sex offender? You're going to pull all those films. So even if you don't like me, it's like, okay, then you got to pull every person by a bad man, but they're not doing that. And if you want to pull films with messaging, there are films about Alex Jones in Oklahoma City, which I, I'm not going to call them conspiracy theories or anything like that, but it definitely is a little more of um, it takes more inferential leaps than certainly anything in hoax. Hoax doesn't take any. I told the guys no inferential leaps. Everything is just very much documented by the book. So there's not even anything there that could be called a conspiracy theory. So there it has to be the Bezos thing because it can't be that I'm such a bad guy. And also my book Gorilla Mindset has. That, that's why w with monopolies, we have these complicated relationships. People are like, well, you still sell your book on Gorilla Mindset. It's like, why, yes, I do participate in the marketplace that controls 91% of distribution for books. No, you got I'm such a hypocrite. No, but that, that drives me nuts. And you know, now that we, I make YouTube videos, and everyone's like, well, you complain about YouTube, or how do, why, do you, why do you make your videos on YouTube, put them on BitChute? It's like, well, you still need to survive. And you, there's no shame in making money, and there's no shame in wanting to monetize your hard work, which is what... You know, drives me nuts because this movie, you know, when you first sent it to me, I wasn't, I, I, I know what I was expecting in my head because I knew nothing of the world. That mo the movie was is not a, um, the movie is not a, a a weekend documentary. The movie is, it's 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 well scripted. It's well built. It's the editing is the from a technical perspective, it's magnificent. There was one section where the audio was a little too loud or the music was too loud. I'm not saying that as a joke, but technically yeah. speaking, it's 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 a it's a real work. Um, and the idea that I, how much did it cost you to make the movie? That's right, the documentary. Yeah, so uh, pre-production two hundred fifty thousand, and then post-production another forty k ish. So two hundred ninety thousand all in. And I mentioned the post-production thing because we was uh, I was still very much an independent filmmaker, 
and we're ready to release it. And then one of the producers, Elride, um, Dave L Lugu, who's, uh, Lugu has been on some stuff, said, oh, oh, you know, you got your E&O insurance. And I was like, what's E&O insurance? So it was like, okay. So that delayed it by about six months because for a film of this nature, you um, – you want to get it insured for any kind of copyright infringement claim, any kind of defamation claim. And so then we had to go through the ENO process and that cost, I think the lawyer lawyer was 10 grand and because you have to use a lawyer bonded by the specific insurance company. So the insurance, so all in that was like 25 grand legal review and then the insurance policy. And this is, I mean, if I can ask the personal question coming out of your pocket or do you have funders? Well, he came in money producer. So we crowdfunded about we crowdfunded 170 ish on Kickstarter, and then I threw in about 60 grand of my own money, and then we had a, 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 like I said, Dave came in as kind of the white knight, and he threw in another 50 to 80 k, I think. So back back of the envelope, I put in about 60. They put in 50 to 80, and then the rest of it was crowdfunded. Okay, amazing. Um, and how long? I mean, how long did this take, beginning to end? We did production took. I think we start. I think it was almost a clean year. For I'd I'd have to check. Let me see if I can find the Kickstarter so I can get the exact date. Um, and if I can ask while you do that, who did the editing? I don't. You, you did not do the editing, right? No, 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 no. John, John, and Scooter were directed, directed, and edited it also. At, do you know how many hours of raw footage there was to be edited through? <laughs> Um, from the interviews, from the interviews that we did, I think 80 or 90 or 80 or 90, um, of interviews and, but the footage they went through the archives is crazy. Okay. So we, I did the crowdfund on, okay. When did I, when did I launch this? When did it go live? Time starts to fly. It's, it's interesting too. Cause I'm at the Hicks, I'm at the, uh, the Kickstarter and the, like the movie poster and, and the, everything was completely different than what you begin with. And that's, that's something I think maybe, you know, we could talk about as filmmakers is that you go in thinking you're going to do one film, but if you make documentary films, you're, it changes because when you engage with art, it's not a one way street. The art changes you and changes your own perspective, your own perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, and that I think actually was the the underlying, you know, the story with the red pill is how um, how she thought she was making one documentary, and whether or not it changed her, she might have it, it might have changed her in terms of her exposure to a world that she thought she understood. This, you know, th th this I can understand. You know, the, the the interviews with the people you're sort of you were very familiar with all of your interviewees before the right. movie, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. So July eighth, twenty seventeen is when we went live. And so we went, we did the, we did the crowdfund. We went into production in May because we were in production before the Kickstarter. And then we wrapped production in November the same year. And then it took, then they got me a rough cut. So what happened was, it was actually kind of funny. So we went into production in May, got the crowdfund in July. November, December-ish, I think mid-December, I do my final interview where I wrapped everything up and, and had what we, I thought was going to be the film. And then six months later, they sent a rough cut to me and Shauna. And I was driving, actually, to, um, to of all things, the Kickstarter dinner. So people who were the bigger backers, um, I you know had private dinners with them and everything. And Shauna goes, stop what you're doing. You, you're, you're not going to believe what they just sent. Because I had done a film before Silence that nobody talks about because it wasn't very good, even though I had Dave Rubin before he was a big deal, Candace Owens, Alan Dershowitz, who a lot of people don't like, and that's fine, you know, whatever. And Candace Owens, Milo Yiannopoulos, like I had, but it just didn't hit. And I pulled over and I go, oh, my God, this was so good. And then I had a oh, shit moment because at first I thought, we're going to do a good film. People are going to like it. If you backed it on Kickstarter, you're going to say, you know what? Like, this was a good film. He leveled up from his first film. I like this guy. I'll back his next thing. He delivers. He said he's going to make a film. Most people who on Kickstarter never deliver their films. Hell yeah. I'll give him one more shot. So I thought this was my, you know, white belt was silenced. And people were like, well, you delivered a film, you know, fine. And then Hoax was going to be like my 
purple belt kind of thing. We're like, yeah, he's really leveled up. And then my next one, people would be excited to back. And it was so good. I was like, oh, shit. Okay, I got to really be more of a leader on this now. Because it never would have got finished if I hadn't taken more. Because filmmakers, you just you go into a process where you never finish your work. That That's why most films don't get done is it's not bad faith. But you're like, I can't cut this. I don't want to cut this. And it becomes a, it's just like a legal brief or whatever. You're just like, you, you, just, you, you have to do it. You have a deadline, you know. So I looked at it. It was like three hours rough cut. Beautiful. And then I thought, well, why don't we do a series? I went to my backers. And they said, we want a movie. And I was like, okay, I think a series would be better, a little more avant-garde, but I'm going to give you what you, you know, what you paid for. So we, I was like, guys, we got to have it at one hour and 48 minutes. And then finally, you know, we got it down to two hours and eight minutes, which is long for a documentary, but because of the pacing, it doesn't, doesn't feel long. So we got it released on Vimeo December. So let me see if I have the years right. We finished production – by production, for people who don't know – Production is you're filming people, interviewing people, and then post post production is you start going into the editing and the compositional stuff. So we last interview was December uh, 2017, and then a year later we had it released for sale on Vimeo for so tax purposes, by the way. So uh, a, a tax tip for filmmakers: I got I got a tax bill and I was like hyperventilating and I was like, what what is going on here? And my accountant goes, oh, yeah, you can't you can't take the deduction for – because I got the Kickstarter money, and I threw it all into the project, and I threw my own money. But I got taxed on that 170000 from Kickstarter. And I couldn't write off anything that I spent because you have to wait until the film is for sale. It's a quirk of tax law. So I had to pay – I was like, what is going on? So I told the guys, I'm going to be bankrupt if we don't get this thing out right now. We're getting it out before the end of the tax year. Cause I got you know killed the year before then, so we got it out of Vimeo for sale and and saved me a very, very difficult experience with the IRS. That's for sure. It's interesting, actually, and I can I can see how you could have had the idea of running a series. It could have been six series that would have been a half hour each, as opposed to all of them fitting into a two hour movie. But I think I do think it was the right move to put it into one movie because they were ultimately all intertwined conceptually. Whereas you wouldn't get that same feel if it was a series you'd watch one after the other. Um, and for anybody who doesn't appreciate like a hundred hours of interviews alone, right. uh, for getting the archive footage, like not that it's any measurement, but to, to put out a 10 minute video for me, it's like, you know, I have like between an hour and a half and two hours of footage and it's still a pain in the neck to go through it. But like to go through 80, 90 hours of, of, of interview and you have, and I, I presume, were you the one conducting the interviews from like, technically, were you sitting down? Like you had a memory of what everyone said or was it other people conducting them most, sometimes? Most of them. They did Ryan Holiday on their own. They did. There were two professors, uh, Professor Martinez from UT Austin. They did that one. They did. Um, there was a professor at VT, v, um, Virginia Tech, I think. They did that one. So they they had the best of both worlds because I really gave them. I only made one editorial decision on the film, but I gave them full creative control to do their thing, and then just as a producer, provided you know the kind of vision and leadership that people might need. But I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't fight with them. They wanted this guy in it. They wanted a, another person in it. And I, but I, so I did Jordan Peterson. I did most of the big interviews, but Holiday I would have liked to have done, but he was very like, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I won't. So I'm like, guys, just go get the interview. Why he said he will. Don't give him time to change his mind. So then they went down and did it on their own. And uh, I'm going to ask, maybe I shouldn't even ask it. Did you have any issues with the people you interviewed in terms of how they appreciated their depiction in the documentary? Um, no, um, not at all. They're not, not at all actually, because we, we kept our word to people. I said that I'm going to present the, my job is to prevent, to present to you the best version of you and your strongest arguments. So that, that's how we treat a black lives matter. Like, okay, this is, you know, Hawk Newsom has said quite a few things that I think contradict maybe what he was in the film, but that's not the deal. The deal is, you're going to give me your best version of yourself. I'm going to present the strongest case for you and your cause if you're in a Cernovich film, and I'm not going to play any kind of games, no gotcha stuff, no checkmate. So everybody was was happy with what um, they did. Now, a couple of people got pushback. Hawk got some pushback um, because they were like, I can't believe you're in this guy's film and everything else. But ultimately, he you know he saw the value in it because it, it I think it elevated him in a lot of ways and helped him in a lot of ways to be in the film too. But 
that that was the biggest issue was a, a couple people got a little drama from their fan bases, but um, but because of the way the film was presented, it wasn't like here's Ryan Holiday saying Mike Cernovich. You know, like if I had edited Ryan Holiday, he'd be like Mike Cernovich is a great human being. Then yeah, I think he'd have been mad. But instead, he's in there saying yeah, I think Mike is kind of morally flawed in a lot of ways, but he's morally flawed in the same way the media is flawed, and the media hates him because he just does what they did to him. So how, you know, how can you be mad about that when I'm presenting you and your authentic truth and not using you just as um, you know, status shocking to be like, Oh look, I got these big names in my film and they're all saying that I'm like so cool and so great. It's interesting. Um, and I, I can imagine the flack that some people might must have gotten for being in the video. It, it is, it's an amazing thing actually just, I don't know you any more than I know you from social media, from, from our discussions. I know how the media has depicted you and I know how the media has depicted a bunch of other people who I would not agree with that depiction. And it really makes you wonder, I mean, when the media portrays an, um, an image of somebody, how accurate or how absolutely inaccurate it is and how many people jump on that inaccurate depiction to form some pretty fundamental opinions and judgments, not just of the people, but of other people who associate with them. So I can, can totally imagine a bunch of people in the video getting a significant amount of flack from their fan base who who finds guilt by association, which is already a problem, based on a fundamental inaccurate uh, personification or description of an individual, that being you. Well, you um, want to hear the big, so here's the biggest surprise. Um, Jordan Peterson pretended like he was never in the film. He, you know, if you wrote an article, if you're the Guardian and you write an article, Jordan Peterson is a Nazi, he'll give you 100,000 clips. I can't believe they said this awful thing about me, right? Like it's that boomer thing where, hey, don't don't give them clicks about hate pieces of you. You know, get the quote that they say the thing and then just respond to it on social media. But he just his followers were like, hey, hoax was great. He just pretended like it never happened. So he was the one who was most, and that's because there's a lot of back back drama with a guy named Sam Harris. And Sam got to Jordan is like Mike Sternwich is a terrible person and and, th and they formed this like little like the, the backstory gossip girl stuff was kind of funny actually because everybody's a man and they're in their forties or fifties were old men and I like I read this article in New York Times where they're like here's the intellectual dark web and I can't believe Dave Rubin ever talked to Mike Cernovich right and that was Barry Weiss's kind of deal with them which is hey we'll give you Joe Rogan and Sam Harris um, and Jordan Peterson I'll be your like little press agent and give you good press. But I don't like Cernovich, so like you can't talk to him. And if you're in a project with him, you can't really mention. This is all a true story, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so Sam and and Barry Barry or however you say his name, they got to Jordan, and we're like, you never should have been in that film. We would have warned you away from it. Just like hope it like dies down and blows over or whatever. So Jordan just completely pretended like it never happened, and that's fine. I mean, that's his right. And I got lucky because. When he was in the film, I was a bigger name than him. So he was working his way up the chain by being in my film. But then he had this meteoric rise where, you know, he's kind of a superstar, so to, so to speak. So I couldn't have got him in the film today. So, yeah, he was – this is all very dumb in a way, but also I think revealing for a lot of people who are watching and maybe are younger. And You think that high school is going to end one day and <laughs> – Everybody becomes a man and everybody becomes a woman and you're just really mature and you collaborate and you, you hash out your differences and no, 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 no. You're, you're in high school for the rest of your life. It, I say the, the high school never changes. It's just the environment that, that, that morphs. Um, and it, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing thing because I remember before I did the first live stream with you, I was, I was very nervous. I was nervous because of what I thought I understood of you based on what I read on Wikipedia and social media. The, the ultimate irony is like the infighting among all of these people who have been similarly demonized. Like, you know, D Dave Rubin, how could he be on your in your movie? How could he talk to you? There's a lot of people who say, how can you talk to Dave Rubin? Like it, it never ends and it gets to a circle point at one point where like everybody is fighting with everybody or judging everybody if, based on one degree of connection. And it, it is absurd. It, it's absurd where people say, just by virtue of giving someone a platform, you are you are partaking in it. Um, yeah, it's, and it's not only that, but it's um, it's immature and it's unhelpful. And because the the argument is, well, if you give Cernovich a platform, he's going to radicalize people. It's like you can read me for what have I? What do I say that is like radicalizing people? It's actually quite the opposite. 
And so that's like the line they use. Like, no, you can't, you can't legitimize this guy because he's such like an evil guy. But meanwhile, Sam Harris is on list as an extremist because he's Islamophobe, right? So Sam Harris is widely understood by a lot of people to be Islamophobic. And he's saying, Jordan, you can't talk to Cernovich because he is some like hardcore, like alt-right guy. It's like, Sam, you're the Islamophobe though. Like that's your thing. And I'm not an Islamophobe. Nobody even thinks of me as like what an Islamophobe. So you're going to police me, but you're actually the real bigot. And then he gets really defensive. How dare you slander me? And then he gets, that's what I mean. It's just like, this is dumb. This is dumb. Everybody needs to grow up and play, you know, by big boy and big girl rules. They're not going to. That's why the country's a mess. That's why the only thing we have to hang our lives on is Trump's tweets. So if you hate him, you have another day to hate him. And if you love him, you, you feel like you get that adrenaline rush or that dopamine rush. And if you're just like me and your hair is getting grayer and you're starting to think about the longer term implications of stuff, you're like, God, I wish I had, you know, you feel a little bad, like that I participated in this clown world shit myself. And so in a way I'm just getting karma for my own stupidity. And like, I understand that, but you, you would hope that some people would reach a certain age where they would maybe reach a deeper level of emotional maturity and you can keep hoping it's not going to happen. It's an interesting thing. This was something, one, the one line I remember from the Amy Winehouse documentary, which was one of the producers saying, you know, life can teach you a lot if you can live long enough. And right. it, it is interesting. Like, first of all, what, before I did the live stream with you, I said, everybody, send me the worst things that, that Cernovich has ever said. I mean, just, I'm un, unabashed. I'm going to ask him about it. Just send them to me. I got some messages, but I, I had read what people said, uh, the media, and I, and I, you know, it's not. It's certainly not what I've been seeing from your social media profile for the last however long I've been following you. Although I know what your history was, and and it's an interesting thing. You get old, you change, you become less, say, less aggressive in a certain sense, but you become more sensitive to certain, you know, realities, um, and you just have to get there. But then, like you saying, I want to talk about the 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 podcast you did with Zuby. It's Z U B Y, right? Yeah, Z Zuby. Yeah, Z U B Y. A great, great podcast. And I was listening to you earlier today on, on Zuby, you know, talking about it. It's like you do learn things. You do regret, you say regret things. You do acknowledge you've done things in the past, which even though they put you where you are in the present, you maybe you, maybe you would have wanted to take back or you would advise others against doing the same thing. Um, and then you get, you know, you, in Zuby's podcast, you were talking about, you know, sort of feeling the, the weight of the world that you might have contributed to on your shoulders. And it, it is the impression I get from you now. And the question is, like in that book, um, John Ronson, so you've been publicly shamed. How long do you hold on to this for? Uh, how long do you try to shame someone for? And, and when do you forgive, if ever? And I like Scott Adams' bit about it. You know, like, what, what, what do you say? I, I forget now what the time was. Was it two decades or the, a decade you can forgive someone or you can sort of not hold their, their past sins uh, in their present life when they're trying to atone and make good? I, you know, it, and, and, the, and of course, the irony of all this too is, Everything is about we need to let felons out of jail. Like you want to let criminals out of jail, right? But you're mad at me for 10-year-old tweets. No. And, and that's also where, like, as much as I have more compassion and empathy and decency, and I think, yeah, I mean, a lot of single moms read me, you know. I don't really need to like I don't need to make fun of being a single mom. You know, it's actually quite hard and whatever. So you're just you you think that you're like, oh, maybe I have a kid, you know, a lot of people read me that have special needs kids. Like Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, should, you know, I don't need to, it's not my messaging isn't to say like terrible things. It's just, I said terrible things and 40 people followed me and it was like, everybody was just goofing off, but then they act like, you know, you've always been that way. So the, the issue though, is it's like, but, and that's why I think I frustrate the left so much is why I won't bow down is you're trying to let you being a left, you know, not you specifically, but my, my argument is you are trying to let people out of prison. You want to give felons the right to vote. You're all about we need to reintegrate felons, violent criminals into society while you're trying to cancel me, while you're trying to cancel people who have said stuff much less offensive than me. No, no, I'm just not going to play that game. I'm not going to do the, the struggle session. I'm not going to not going to do any of that stuff. And that, that does frustrate them because it's like the, the point is, like, I always think of, like, how would you deal with me? And. It's like, how would you deal with somebody where you're like, you've said some offensive things? And I was like, yeah, really dumb. Do you apologize? No. What do you mean you don't apologize? No, I mean, if I said something dumb to you specifically, then, you know, I, I'd probably apologize for that. But, yeah, you're right. So 
but we want a trial. Like, no, no, no. You're like, I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a mature person. I understand we should be more mindful of our words. Like, why, why are people in their 30s being a quote unquote troll? You know, like how the hell did that even happen, right? And the extended adolescence, douchebaggery. I was just a, a douchebag like everyone else. And th so they don't know what to do with me because I'm not going to defend indefensible things. But I'm also not going to grovel before them. So that's why, you know, Sam Harris and them, they just work very hard to just just don't let anybody talk to him. Meanwhile, like a lot of people know who I am, too, which is why it's also kind of, you know, Bar Barry Weiss, for example, like her books don't sell well at all. Hoax was two weeks in a row, top 10 independent film. It's like, I'm, you know, uh, the douchebag coming out of me is like, I'm kind of a big deal. So you're not really no platform to me. You're just being an immature child yourself. And not learning and growing as a person. Um, it's interesting. Hold on, what I was going to say. Oh yeah, for, for, again, last time I referenced the so you've been publicly shamed, but it was the interesting thing where he followed people who have been publicly shamed, and those who survived it and thrived, and those who didn't. And I think it was Max Weber from the F1 guy. He said he survived because he just said, you know, I. It, it was almost like I'm not apologizing. It was a different. It's a, it depends on what the acts are for which people are demanding the forgiveness, but. You know, the, the two who survived, uh, Justine Sacco and Max Weber, was because at some point you say, that's it. I'm not apologizing for it. Because the reality is the apology is not being sought as an actual sincere apology, but rather just a silence. Um, so, I mean, and I, and I understand the both sides. I do, you know, I'm of the opinion you apologize. Well, there's certain philosophical ideas. You apologize three times. And after the third time, if the people don't, don't forgive you, then it's their fault. And that's easier said than done. But you apologize for something that you did not do on purpose, something that was, you know, a, a momentary lapse. But you don't apologize for things you did on purpose that you intended to do and that you were aware of at the time you were doing them. And in that sense, like trying to make someone apologize for a tweet they deliberately sent ten years ago, when the overall context was different. Yeah, the the the, the, the apologies have been weaponized, and that's the depressing thing. And that's why nobody can apologize because they're no longer sincere requests, or you know, they're not sincere demands anymore. And I think the only, the only way to survive is to say, I'm going to, I'm going to live with it and hate me even more. The people who are going to hate you more are probably going to be the ones who would never have forgiven you in the first place, which is. Well, the and the studies show that. Yeah. The studies, the studies show that, which is all you do is make your followers lower their morale because they support you. And they're like, well, I support this guy, but he won't even stand up for himself. And then the people you apologize to, don't but aren't like wow okay you know this is a maybe i had this guy pegged wrong i mean even there's even this um like the, the you know speaking of documentaries like i made a film released it it's done well now there's a film about me a, a documentary that i didn't make about me where you know i was just completely lied to about the process who is going to be in it and then i'm reading the interviews with the filmmakers and you're like okay, so you're just creating a fake film about me and that, so it's a very kind of meta, and the journey of life, so to speak, is very kind of meta. I make films and then I have a film made about me, a documentary film made about me, but it's one that's much less honest than my own films. Okay, then, then let me ask you, can we talk about it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what is the documentary? And explain the process of agreeing to be in it, because it's not like they're pulling archive clips of you without your authorization. You agreed to be a part of this documentary. Yeah. So the film was being done by the Atlantic and it was called, um, it's called white. I know what it's called now, but that's not how it's pitched to me. So I'll tell you right now, the film is called white noise and it's about the white supremacist movement in America. And it features Richard Spencer, Lauren Southern and me. So that's um, definitely not how the project was pitched to me. The way the project was pitched to me, and uh, a little foreshadowing, I'm a filmmaker myself, so maybe I maybe I recorded them too. You know, that's something. That, <laughs> filmmaker and a lawyer, and and yeah. an intelligent lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, a lawyer with some crafty old you know old man tricks. So, you know, maybe maybe I have some uh, recordings of myself that can authenticate what I'm saying and improve what I'm saying, not only in the court of public opinion, but in a in a court of law. So, I was approach to be in a film and i was like look i don't want to be in any movies like i don't want i i can make my own films i don't want i don't want to be in a film and they go okay 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 just just 
be in a film where it's about this right wing movement. And we're going to interview and follow like 15 people and you'll be in it for maybe like five minutes. And I was like, okay. I'm like, I'm busy. And I was like, but there can't, Richard Spencer can't be in the film though. Like he won't be in the film. I was like, okay. I was like, cause I'm telling you up front, and this is before I signed the waiver. So if any lawyers are watching, they know what a fraudulent inducement is. And I was told to induce me to agree to the project and to induce me to, to sign a legally binding contract that Richard Spencer wouldn't be in a film. Cause I was like, I've done everything I can to distance myself from them. And I was called in 2017. So this is like old news, old news. And they're like, he won't be, we promise you. I'm like, okay. So I do it thinking again, it's going to be a big film about a lot of people. And then I'll just have like a little bit in it. And then next thing you know, the guy's like going to everything, every event that I do, like tailing me, Cl like Columbia, he became like my shadow, Columbia University when I gave a college talk there, an event I had in New York, events I had in DC. I did a, an event with Kelly Ward in Arizona, so they actually flew out to do it. And then I was like, oh God, you know, like, why are you filming me so much? You know, like, I don't need to be in anybody's kind of film. And he was like filming me, like working out. He's like, oh, you know, take me through a day in the life, like, a, you know, just some hill sprints and everything. And then, like, we had a, like, a, it's a very cordial, not cordial, like a very, like, he's told me intimate details about his life, which I will respect that, um, you know, of the things that I, you know, recorded and everything else. Like, that's a, a boundary that um, I'm not going to break. But we were quite close. And then all of a sudden, I get a, I get an email from somebody like, you know, you're in a documentary with Richard Spencer. And the documentary has this, it looks like a horror film, white noise. There's a okay sign with very like horrible black and white um, photograph, pictograph. So it looks like a horror film. If you were going to, you know, if you were going to watch a, um, if you're going to watch like a horror film where a bunch of evil people go out and, you know, kill people, then this would be, you know, this would be, this would be the approach that you would use. And I was like, oh, God. And then it's like white noise. We follow the history or we follow the alt-right through the eyes of Lauren Southern, Mike Cernovich, and Richard Spencer. And I was like, are you kidding me? No, no, I, I was just Googling the image to show, but I'm not even showing the image because I'm, I'm sure that'll get the video taken down. It's the, it's the exact hand gesture we were talking about with black and white uh, etched on... Um, and it says white noise, which, which the Atlantic presents white noise. Right. Yeah. So, so you're like, oh my God, you know, I did not agree to this. And, but then like my approach with him, you know, so it's a different approach. And I think where a lot of people might not understand about me is like, I've worked on my, like I was doing ayahuasca all weekend. Like I work on myself and I don't want to be angry at this person. I don't want to be angry at them lying to me. But it's just, they just objectively lied. I have plenty of videographic and audio evidence to prove that they just lied to me. So I'm thinking, you just completely lied to me. And you're the Atlantic, because Comedy Central, uh, not the Comedy, the Daily Show. Trevor Noah, that they've tried to get me on their shows many, many times. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, I don't participate in some kind of clown show. I'm not going to be your little, you know, dancing gorilla or whatever. And, but the Atlantic, you're just not supposed to lie about stuff like this. And, you know, like I understand that we're in a different time, but it's like you lied to me to get me to sign a contract. This is this is fraud and the inducement. This is like legal shit. This is legal 101. So I'm like, so I'm sitting here like, am I gonna, you know, what am I gonna have to do? And I'd rather, you know, not not take that approach. But it's a little frustrating. So let me, uh, let me, you know, I, I, let me t read a segment to you from an interview just to kind of show the perspective. Um, that they took in the film because I think I think they're going to be hoisted by their own petard. So you, you, have not, you haven't seen it yet, right? No, no, I haven't seen it yet, but I've read a few interviews and everything like this. And so I want to read um, a line from the filmmaker today. Um, White Noise's unfiltered access was incredibly difficult to achieve. It took months of negotiation. And then here's what it says about me. Cernovich likes to project alpha, but opens up in the film – about his own unhappiness and his mother's struggle with mental illness. It took hours of interviews to get him there. And I'm like, wait, so, and, and from other things that I've heard in the film, 
they try to make it look like I'm an alpha on the internet, but I'm actually like a not an alpha. Like they, they think that makes me look bad. So I'm reading that. And I'm like, okay, so you're going to use my, my mother's in a mental institution. I opened up about that and how it makes me sad to think that, you know, with mental illness, you're a prisoner in your own mind and you're going to die in a mental institution. And like, they want to use that against me to somehow show that I'm not an alpha male or whatever. And I'm like, I don't even know that I need to go to war with these people. I think people are going to watch that and be like, that's pretty fucking horrific. Like, this is not, this, this is just so, so kind of like beyond the pale. Like, can you believe this guy? He's sad because his mom's going to die in a mental institution because she had bipolar. Like we got him good there. So in that regard, I just feel kind of sad, um, honestly, that sad that, that you would lie to people to do a film and then that you would think that showing that a man is sad that his mom is going to die, living in terror of voices seen and unseen in a mental institution is how you win, right? So I can't even be angry that I was lied to. I read something like that, and that's what the filmmakers on words. I just feel kind of sad, to be honest. Uh, I got to say, Carpe Donctum, who I know we all see on Twitter. Thank you, Mike. Carpe, keep up with the memeing. They are some of the, some of them are good. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's amazing. But but uh, look, because I know what the 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 caption of the article said, it didn't just stop at trying to call it shame you for for opening up. But there are some accusations in there that are potentially you know prejudicial. I mean. What else did they describe you as, Mike, to to lead you yeah. there? They they called you a white nationalist in the in the in the in the article, right? They're going. Yeah, they're going. That's what I said, and they're going to be in for the Atlantic's legal team's going to be in for a few surprises because um, when you sign a waiver to be in a film, you generally waive what's called a false light cause of action. So false light means that they didn't make something up about you, but they edited things in a way to lead a reader to reach a conclusion about you that's false. And generally speaking, when you do any, and that's why I don't do the daily show or other things is that false light cause of action waiver. But in this instance, we have um, video evidence indicating how I was induced to be in the film. So their, uh, their waiver is not going to get them very far and they'll, they'll figure that out real quick. And I think it'll be interesting, you know, if I pursue that, cause I might not, I'm, I'm, you know, because based on what I've heard, another thing I heard about it was um, that there's a scene where they they like, oh, yeah, Mike, he sells gorilla pills, but he like can't even run up a hill. He can't even exercise. And I thought back. To, yeah. So first of all, it's just dumb. Um, secondly, but I remember that scene. I was Daniel's like, oh, what do you do for the, for workout? I was like, oh, today I usually do like hill sprints. He's like, OK, I like filming some hill sprints. So I did like a bunch of hill sprints. And then at the last one, I just laid down and I was like, you know, gassed just completely. And so apparently there's like a big shot of him, like hovering over me, making it look like I'm just like com this, like completely out of shape guy who can't even exercise. But I pretend to be like an alpha male. And yeah, I see you kind of laughing. That's the whole thing. That's just dumb. That's just dumb. You know, it's no, but first of all, it, it's, it's. The idea that you know fat shaming it would even be acceptable in a, in a one directional sense is objectionable, and incidentally for anybody, I mean I don't know if you do the Spartan races, those obstacle course races. We have them here. Like when you when you have to scale a mountain five times, your legs cramp up by the fifth time. It's not. It's but right. yeah, the, the false light thing. It's it's an amazing thing to for you know I've never I've never done. I, I was in the uh, Netflix somebody feed Phil documentary. I wasn't exactly worried about them, you know, making me look like. Uh, a gluttonous pig who doesn't know how to eat sushi. It's a different realm when you're, you know, when you agree to go on to certain politically charged uh, documentaries where getting back to the 80 hours of, of um, interview footage you have, it's very easy to, to get one soundbite out of all those interviews that would actually destroy someone, uh, right. e either out of context or a moment where somebody makes a, an inappropriate joke. Uh, so if they want to do that, it's very easy when they trail you around for, for days on end and it's and and then you, yeah, I mean, you, what's the what's why would you do that to yourself if you didn't have assurances that that wasn't going to be the object of the documentary? And then the flip side is, what purpose is that other than you know in continuing in the vein of this fake you know the fake news theme where, in order to get clicks, they have to do this sort of demonizing people to get people enraged to get them to click and to get them to share. And it's it's disingenuous and it's destructive to to I mean it's it's destructive to dialogue. It's, it's just a rant, actually. I'm not, I don't know. Point there. 
Right. So from my perspective, just as a lawyer and, you know, a person who's pretty, you know, savvy about PR is I think it's going to flop The Andrew Morantz wrote this big, huge book about me. And he went on every podcast, including Sam Harris. So Sam Harris will tell people that you can't talk to me. But then if somebody writes a book about me, they talk about me for two hours, right? It's that I call it, you can talk about him, but you can't talk to him. Gossip kind of thing. And his book just was a complete flop. And he did every podcast. Kara Swisher's New York Times book review. He got the full PR blitz and it was just flop. And based on what I've read, uh, including, you know, especially including Daniel's interviews and other early interviews, I think this is going to flop because if your perspective is, hey, Mike Servich pretends he's alpha, but like he's also sad and he maybe gets emotional when he talks about things and he's really tired after going to the gym and like lays down on the ground and hyperventilates. I just don't, I don't see the, the there there. I don't see people being, wow, this is compelling. This no, is it's, compelling. it's just a question of making someone look like trying to depict them as a hypocrite to the people who follow them. It's, 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 right. uh, yeah. but a mandatory hair says false light, false light, not like, uh, and it's, it's, it's different than defamation. Defamation is the state uh, the utterance or publication of a statement. That's false. False light is factually correct, but misrepresents or, you know, depicts someone in a false manner. Actually, actually, I think um, the Osundaro brothers were suing uh, Smollett's attorneys. Part of it was defamation. Part of it was false light because some of the stuff they were saying might have been true, but depicts them in a, in a bad way. So uh, it's a different. It's a separate cause of action under U.S. law, and you know that that I was able to learn from my series of vlogs on the subject. Um, did they? I mean, the gig the, when the documentary pitches it to you—is it a paid gig or is it just totally pro bono? Okay. No, no, and that's what I also told them. I was like, "Look, like I'm a busy guy. I don't, I don't need, you know, I don't have any desire to be filmed by other people. Like, I don't, I don't need to do this. This is a busy thing." And he was with me, just me, at least eighty hours, at least just me. And there, there's another scene where he he says that, or one of the inter, one of the interviewers goes, "Oh yeah, there's a scene with Mike Cernovich, and he's just really sad and pathetic as he drives alone in his car." and talks about how he hates himself. And I was like, and then I remembered I was with Daniel and he was filming me and I was driving my car and I might've had the top down. And he's like, so like, you know, this is our last interview, you know, how this process go? Like, what are you thinking? Kind of, he goes, just be like real stream of conscious. And I was really stream of conscious. And so apparently that's edited too, to make me look like that I'm, um, like a disgust. I think the I think the exact word was that I'm disgusted with myself. And I'm like, okay, um, no, no. I'm, I'm not. But no, and it's an amazing thing because you could for anybody who has not edited a movie, it is so easy to change an entire sentence by editing out a word by editing out the prior sentence. And in which case, you actually have it. But you say like, I regret something that I've done can be edited to say, I hate myself or make it sound like you hate yourself. As if, and the other thing is, is as if there's any problem in being a human who we are complex, we've done things we regret, we've done things we're proud of, we do aspire, generally speaking, we do aspire to be liked, to be loved, to be appreciated, to be value added to this earth, as if that's a flaw. And, and as if that's a flaw with that ultimate goal in mind to potentially regret some of the things that we have done in the past that might not be aligned with that current goal. It's, it's as if it's to demonize the human experience and the evolution that, that goes along with being fundamentally flawed humans. It's, it's, right. It is upsetting, but it's also why nobody places much value in, in certain types of media. Well, yeah, here, here's a quote. Um, so this is a person who got an early, a early screener of the film. Mike Cernovich is self-proclaimed professional troll for Trump in Orange County. Yeah, because that's, you know, if you read me, that's what I'm totally am. It's perhaps a documentary. By the way, that would be false light. So false light would be, I actually said, oh, yeah, I'm totally just a big troll because I said it. So it's not a lie to say that I said it. But if you interview me saying that and you, and you represent that as if it's true, now you've cast me in a false light. Because it's still you're you're lying about what a person actually said, but in any event, so the the reviewer goes on driving alone, minding the camera more like a therapist. He admits he is disgusted by his own reflection. It is a moment of humanity that, though it doesn't excuse his actions, at least gives Cernovich a dimensionality and perhaps a reason he seeks the approbation of complete strangers. 
It's like, so, so th that was the scene though. He's like, yeah, just tell me what you're thinking. So I, I can assure you, I did not say that I'm disgusted with myself um, at all, ever in any kind of interview. But that's again, where the editing comes in. You can edit somebody to look like anything you want. And that's why if you're going to make a documentary, that's a hit job on somebody, you have them sign a waiver saying that they can't sue you for editing them dishonestly. But hey, when you fraudulently induce a person to sign a contract, guess what? False light shit doesn't hold up. So, so, so again, we'll see. Okay, amazing. Now, on Un Civil Law, who's my moderator, and I, I sometimes should schedule live streams better with other people. How long are we going to go? Not, I see 25 more minutes max because I don't want to keep Mike here all afternoon. And, and, but I, and we're sort of coming to the end of the discussion, but say 25 minutes. I think two hours is more than, uh, than I should think I'm entitled to of, of, of another individual's afternoon. Um, yeah, it, it's it's amazing, and as and as if there's a flaw in wanting to be liked from by other people, and the the paradox of being you know the trying to portray you as a professional troll who gets off by getting hated versus what you know seeking the uh, the approbation of others. As I, I'm 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 eager to see how it turns out, not because I want to see this documentary particularly. I, I just want to see how how inaccurate or rather how not in line with my understanding of who you are as a person this is going to be. Out of curiosity, morbid curiosity. Yeah, yeah. So the it was apparently there. We'll see. But my, my, you know, and so for making predictions, somebody can cut this and dunk on me later. But my prediction is that it doesn't land because people don't like caricatures. People like complicated figures. What makes a person compelling, at least from from the point of cinema? If you're making cinema, you want compelling people who are complicated. Pablo Escobar, for example, what made Narco such a success is he's a terrorist. He bombed a courthouse and a little girl and a bunch of little kids died because of that. But he loved his family. He was complicated. The drug wars, morally unjust. He was you know, wrongfully kept out of parliament when everybody else there was corrupt. So you're, you're like, this is a really compelling, that's compelling TV. Tiger King, for example. Joe Exotic is a, is a pretty reprehensible kind of person. But uh, aren't we all in our own ways reprehensible? Aren't we all in our own ways being led to temptation and fighting against temptations and wrestling with our demons and trying to find our better, better angels? That's what people want to see in a film, Wild Wild Country, right? They did some things that were pretty bad, but they were, they were pushed into it. It's a bit, so people want to talk about these films. But if you're just like, here's Mike Cernovich, tired after running a hill. He says he doesn't like himself very much. And he's sad because his mom has bipolar and is going to die in a mental institution. Nobody's going to be like, oh, shit, yeah, we want to, you know, we want to spread the word about that. We want to talk about that. So I, th I think it flops. I, 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 I would think it's going to flop just because I'm not sure who trusts documentaries by these mainstream media outlets anymore. Like, if, if I watch them, I specifically watch them to to spot and dismantle the inaccuracies. Yeah. Uh, and that's the level of cynicism I think everybody Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people view any documentary that comes out of the mainstream media with. But we'll see. By the way, that's a good point because we were talking about hoax, and I'm sure some people are making films. So I want to make sure that if you're an independent filmmaker and you want to make a film, like pros and cons. So, uh, you know, maybe we want to do like a little AMA, you know, 10 quick questions about filmmaking for people in the chat or something where, you know, ask me anything. How much does it cost? What was the hardest part about it? What did you dislike most about it? How did you, da, 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 you know, anything people want to ask about filmmaking. So you could just even say five minutes. So you can even clip the video five minutes, Mike Cernovich on independent filmmaking. One, one hour, 38 and a half minutes. Let's do it. Five okay. minutes. Oh, let's do Ask questions about making a movie. I'll start fielding while people get their questions in there. We know how much it cost. Uh, we know how long it took. We know it's interesting that you did not. What was the one uh, veto uh, artistic power that you exercised in the movie or the decision you made uh, production wise? They were a little more sympathetic to a uh, conspiracy theory associated with me than I thought. It made it look like we were almost defending a certain thing that I did. And I just wanted to make it very clear that we weren't defending it because then people would be like, Oh, this is a conspiracy theory film. But that's an interesting thing that the, the, the pizza gate in the intro, I mean, I, and you've walked back on some of the things you've said and you know, the, 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 the pizza shop itself being the underground. Never said that. That's the whole point. Right. I walked back with the media accused me of saying, and, and that's what we, but that's why 
So in, in terms of filmmaking, and this is just persuasion in general, um, you have to just lead in to, if you want to reach people outside of your echo chamber, you have to lean in to the bad. You have to lean into the gray areas. You have to lean into the criticism. You just have to say, oh, you probably think I'm going to make this film. Boom. And you lean into it in a completely different kind of manner while not accepting the framing of your enemy, right? So for me, I like as I went, I was like, you know, since we finished Hoax, I got the records in Jeffrey Epstein. That's what I was talking about. When I was talking about pedophilia rings, I was talking about Epstein. Oh, but you're making that up, Mike. I'm making it up that I filed a lawsuit to unseal these records in 2016 and that I actually won them. Like, no, clearly not. So th that's, the, that's the whole vibe of it is where – I'm not going to pretend like there's not a criticism about me, but I'm also not going to let you define the terms of the debate and then make me play defense, defense the whole time. Well, and the idea that you might've been, you know, that the conspiracy part was where and when, and the certain details about that Pizzagate, anybody who read the emails that were at the heart of Pizzagate, whether or not that's how the, the emails uh, played out, anybody who read those emails is asking questions as to what on earth they're talking about, because it's quite clear the emails are code for something. So there's like there's an element of the conspiracy theory that people try to demonize, but then there's the other part where like anybody reading those emails knows that something's going on because they don't read like normal emails. And so part of the conspiracy theory can be debunked. So what you said is actually what we cut out because I'm like, look, people are going to say it's a pizza gate defense movie and then I'm going to deal with no platforming and everything else. So that was the whole idea. Like there, there was a segment in here where I'm like, here I am. Here's the email. Translate this. And then I was even like, if you don't like what I'm saying, John Podesta, sue me. And then I threw it on the ground because I would be perfectly fine meeting him in court because I was never threatened with any kind of lawsuit or anything because because uh, I didn't say what the media's accused me of doing. But that was the whole point was, I, you know, we, I was like, look, I know how that will be spun. That's going to be spun as if I'm defending – everything that happened at Comet and it's just going to be a big mess. So that was the only thing that we really, um, where I was like, look, just trust me on this guys. We got to, we got to cut that part out. Interesting. Now someone said, uh, Nova says, Viva, how are people allowed to make up lies and not be punished for the provable lies? Eh, the, the standard is actual malice when it comes to public figures and going to court and doing it costs a lot of money, even if you're right. And it's not, uh, it's not always a slam dunk, even in the most slam dunky of cases. This is a good one here. Justin S says, how do you go about getting notable people to participate in your documentary? Right. So there, it, let, let's say, let's just start from the beginning and you're not me and you don't have a big name. So, cause having a, a name yourself is pros and cons. The classic thing is you work your way up the chain, get a name in the film. And then you know your pitch to the next person. You say, Hey, I'm doing a film and that name is in the film. And now you worked your way up higher up the food chain. And then in the next email, you're using social proof, essentially, to the next person. You're saying, so, for example, in Hope with Silenced, I pitched Jonathan Haidt, and the only reason I couldn't get him in it is because his schedule was booked. But I said, hey, Jonathan Haidt, I'm doing a documentary on free speech and self-censorship. Dave Rubin's in it, and you know a couple other people that people would know his names are in it. And he's like, oh, sounds like a good project, and it just didn't go that way. So you, you just don't go to the biggest name and say, will you be in my film? Because people are busy. People don't know if you're a flake. People don't know if they should take you seriously. There's all this background baggage. You And, I, and I've actually had people try to um, – I've actually had people try to try to um, sneak where they're like, will you be in this film? It's going to have somebody else in it. And then I message that person. And they go, I didn't, I didn't agree to be in the film. But, yeah, you, you, you work your way up the chain of status hierarchy by using social proof and showing that you respect – the the chain of command and by the way when you're doing that it isn't just a tactic it's a broader strategy which is that's how you show people that you're not a flake that this isn't just some random thing you're doing and you're a fly-by-night person and you won't finish it you're showing that you have that kind of emotional nuance and emotional understanding that you need to get to get people to participate okay very interesting yeah i mean it's it is the it's the interesting thing people don't like it name dropping sometimes is leads to suspicious or suspicion but social credibility, somebody knowing that you're not a schlock who's going to take what they said out of context or that you're not going to embarrass them or that you're just not totally, that you have some sort of street cred, which is why like, you know, the art from artists is worth more than the very same painting from someone who has not dedicated the last 10 years to the, to the practice. So it is, it's having a name I, from what I, you know, I can even say like 
having a name allows you to get people to answer the phone because they know that you at least exist and you have some sort of a provable history. Um, right. Courtney Grace says, how do you approach people to interview them? As a self-conscious introvert, I have a hard time approaching people to interview for projects. Also, what is your favorite warm-up question for interviews? Yeah, um, that's that's a tough one. Warm-up questions for interviews are hard because you you have to you have to tailor it to the person. So the number one thing is if you're interviewing, say, for example, a name people recognize like Jonathan Haidt, you read his book, do your homework. The, a lot of the reason people get snubbed is because you haven't done your homework. And so you go in and you just say, oh, yeah, I read this book. And you ask about something that they have in the book. And that shows that you have a familiarity with their body of work. Because here's, I'll just tell you, here's why people don't want to be in films. Hey, Mike, will you be in my film? Okay, so I'm going to spend two or three hours on someone else's schedule for a film that probably won't get made, and the person doesn't know anything about me, and they're just going to ask me dumb basic questions, and what a waste of my time. That, that's what you have. That's, that's the no. That's the big no that everyone has. So, but if instead you go, hey, Mike, will you be in my film? This other person is going to be in my film, and what I want to talk about is your, you know, this book you read, and, and you show that you actually understand it. Then people are like, yeah, sure, you know, I'll, I'll give you a shot because you you always want to give people a shot. And then when you're talking to the person and the warm up questions, if you've done your homework and read the book, it's just very natural. It's just very natural. I noticed what you said the following it, and you're and this is just off camera. Say, so, oh yeah, I remember I watched you at your your interview with this other thing, and you said that, and I thought that was interesting. And then you get people in kind of the flow of conversation. It, and just to add to that, not knowing information about the person you're asking a it's flattering everybody loves it and it's it's flattering in a cynical sense but you need to know your subject and you need to show them that you that you know who they are um let me see here so some of the, terry says do you expect to be sued for inciting unpolitically correct views through this movie no i don't think i i think mike is is has come to terms with the risks and perils of potentially being sued and and is seems more methodical than some people might think King Couture says this is not necessarily about the movie. How will you deal with everything with the upcoming second Schmanch Mendrick they are planning, or will you continue to do your stuff or stay locked in? Yeah, they're talking about the second wave in Canada as well, when the, the first one may have not materialized the way they were predicting it from the beginning. Um, uh, let's see here. Do we have any other questions? The one, one thing I want to do. Um, okay, well, here's my question to you. Do you run your final product by the people in your video before, uh, before the in the documentary before you publish? No, um, I don't have any objection to that per se, but there's like just all kinds of like copyright rules and everything else. And the one exception to that is the only criticism that's legitimate of hoax is I didn't have enough lefty reporters in there. So I went to numerous Columbia Journalism Review people, everybody who'd ever written about me, and I said, I will give you. 90 seconds to say whatever you want about me and I will let you choose that clip and that's the clip that I will include. No, they, they wouldn't do it. I even asked Ben Smith, who's now at the New York Times. He was in at BuzzFeed editor-in-chief. I was like, Ben, if you want to come in, grill me and I promise you that I'll use whatever grilling session that you want to do. So I gave that approach to a lot of people, but that's the exception to the rule. Ordinarily you don't and ordinarily people don't really care. Like, they um if if they agreed to be in your film, they know it's probably gonna be worthwhile with some exceptions, of course, including the one that I'm currently dealing with. And they don't they don't need to see it and they don't have creative control in it, so it doesn't do anybody any good. I mean, and I imagine the risk is unless you unless you have a neurosis like me and you're nervous about inadvertently offending someone, the risk is if you send it to them and they then they start thinking they can nitpick and have creative control, and then you're doing that with ten people. And then it becomes impossible. And then you feel that you actually have the obligation to do it for every subsequent change to the video or the movie. Um, it becomes sort of like a, a Pandora's box of accommodating to the expectation that you might have just created by asking their opinion in the first place. Yeah, it becomes too many um, too many chefs kind of you know spoil the pot, so to speak. It's the same way with we we went the co we went with co directors, which presented a lot of perils. Even having two directors. Can, can sometimes be too much. You sometimes just want one director and you want a clear chain of command. So we had a director of cinematography who was kind of a director light too. And then you can see sometimes, you know, horns are coming out and, and that kind of happens. So 
do you want a co-director, direct, have one director, and then an editor who works under the director, and a director of cinematography who still works under that chain of command is the, is the usual approach, and that's the best approach. This one, Hoax had kind of a special kind of magic, and but otherwise, yeah, co-directing can present a lot of challenges. For, first of all, whoever decided, whoever came up with the uh, the actual billboard, it's it is a work of art. It's it's actually it's beautiful. It's graphic. It's almost it's almost violent in a in a in a comedic way. It it, it, it is it is very catchy. Benjamin yeah. Avsex says, "How does Mike consistently stay one page ahead while maintaining his sexiness?" Okay, I don't think we need an answer to that. <laughs> uh, someone had a good one here. You have a professional, film. so that would be another piece of advice too. Is um, so if you want to make a film, just make it. Just get B roll footage. That was where I was even training my directors. Is I, I was saying. Because they would go in to like a person's house, and it would be there'd be all this compelling footage, and they would be just so focused on getting that interview that you're not telling the story of the person. And what you want to do, especially if you're making documentaries, you want to walk around. This is the office of the person. You want to let because you're telling a story visually. One of the books I read on documentary filmmaking said if a person can listen to your documentary, it's a podcast. It isn't a documentary, and that artistically drove us is sure you can look away and check your phone while you're watching hoax, but you need to watch it to fully experience it. And that differentiates it from the, the classic, it's called the talking head documentary. Oh, here, here's Vivi, here's Cerno, here's AJ, here's this other guy talking and they're all just kind of talking. And it's one never ending series is of a Charlie Rose interview. That's not a documentary film. That That's a podcast. So if you're going to make a film, you want to draw people in visually. So you're telling the story of the person without using your own words. So example of that of a show don't tell is, oh, and then, you know, because you have, we didn't do this with hoax because I don't like that style where you have the God narrator. Hi, I'm Mike Cernovich, and I'm about to lead you through the wild and crazy world of fake news. And here I'm, I'm meeting this friend of mine in Canada. And here, here I am, and here he's about to talk, and he's an interesting guy. Instead, you do the shot. You show the person with his kids if that's the image you want to present. You show the person with, I don't know, if he's got a cool car or a quirky car or quirky office or whatever. You're showing that as you bring people into the scene. And then that visual storytelling conveys a message that you want to convey. Amazing. Um, we got Sean Kelly says, how did you get a distributor and what was their cut? Uh, distributor, we had quite a few offers. Um, I can't just, that's one thing I'm on NDA is in terms of their cut. But it's um it's a considerable percentage. If you use a reputable distributor, it's a it's a considerable percentage. Yeah, there are industry standards also. I think people can probably look up online. Um, how can I send the video? How can I send this video to someone if I download it? Is it not to be shared, dude? You can download this video and share it, Mike. By the way, feel free to use all of this or any of this for your for your uh, platform as well. If you want to cut some sections out, um, I want to get a couple more questions here. See, if you see any, let me know. Um, okay, if anybody if anybody can get another question here. Cerno, here we go. Take on Mencius Moldbug, relevant today? I don't know what that is. He's uh, you know, he's sort of the, the, lead, the leader of what they call the intellectual dark, or not the intellectual dark, what the dark enlightenment. There's so much dark, dark um, labels, um, so many dark labels that you can't keep track. He's he's just a brilliant guy who has a wonky blog, and he's a sort of a thinking man's. He he's where you know how you say like you're the lawyer that lawyers go to when they have a trouble per, trouble, right? He's a thinking person, the thinking person's thinking person. Okay. Um, oh, here's one. Let's see here. Viva Mike Sernovich do a documentary on the death count around the. <laughs> Okay. Um, sorry. I th not that there's anything wrong with humor um, or satire. Uh, do I have another question about the movie? Mike, is there anything you want to say about the movie before we uh, wind up? Finish it. Just finish your film. Finish your project. Ship it. I, I know. I, yeah. Just ship it. Better than perfect. Ship it. And that that's my number one. There's a reason that everybody from Steve Jobs to your filmmaking professor said real artists ship. You get so wrapped up and because here's what happens. Um, this happens if you write a book. It happens if you're doing like yard work. You, the first time you pick up a pickaxe and you start digging, you dig like kind of a bad hole. And then your work at the very end is better than at the beginning. 
So then you're like, oh, I'm going to go redo that beginning. And then you get to the end and it's even better. And I'm going to go back and you can't do that for infinity. So as you, as you start shooting, your later footage is going to be better than your earlier footage. And then you're like, oh, my God, i got to go back to my earlier footage. But then if you reshoot that, then as you reshoot other things, your new footage is even better. And you end up in this an infinite cycle. So I'm, I'm actually talking to a guy right now who he has a film made, but he, he won't let it go. And so I'm trying to do some kind of mindset coaching with him and just ship. Well, I, and, I mean, I have the, I, the philosophy that even what you think might be a mistake, and even if it is a mistake in the, in the movie or in the final product, it might be the mistake that people find meaning in. And it might be the mistake that actually, um, it might be the mistake that actually sort of creates some sort of additional layer popularity, or whatever, like one of those fateful mistakes. And at some point, you have to live with the imperfections. Otherwise, you'll never get, you'll never go anywhere. It's sort of like Zeno's paradox of perfection. Um, actually, this is a question I, I didn't want to ask it myself just because I know the answer, but Sir, Sir Dialot says, uh, Viva for Cerno. How did this documentary maker explain your mixed race kids if you are a white supremacist? They'll, they'll yeah, we got to watch the film <laughs> to figure that one out. So, and my view on that is a little bit more nuanced than uh, maybe others is I don't think your family is like a human shield from criticism or your ideology, right? So, I'm open to the possibility. Of, of something, but yeah, it is a little absurd. The, the big, the bigger thing that gets me rather than the race is they would, um, and, and that's what, that's what ultimately killed the meme was there's, there was something where they said I was Islamophobic and friends of mine who are Muslim are like, I was at his wedding. Half of his family is Muslim. This is just, this is just dumb. Right? So th there is a component of they, in a film that self defeats it, which is that's, that's the, the struggles of filmmaking is, if you if you actually show me with my kids and then you're narrating, here he is, evil, big, bad, screaming guy holding his daughters, the, the visual is always going to outweigh the the written or the oral messaging. And, and I and I just I mean, I hate the discussion because there is no winning for anybody who makes that accusation. They'll call you white nationalist and they say, oh, there's, you know, there's plenty of self-hating X, Y and Z. You can be you can be a an, you can be a self hating Jew and an anti semite. You can be a race traitor, uh, black and like they'll always it doesn't it doesn't matter if if it, and it's a lose lose in that if you're not married to a Muslim woman with 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 mixed race kids, that's evidence. If you are, that's a shield and it doesn't prove anything because you can be a self hating one regardless. I I just that's why you can't and as far as I'm concerned, you can't entertain certain types of accusations because. They can never be disproven. And like we've said in many previous vlogs, you know, the power lies in the accusation. Um, Benjamin Aftsex says, Mike, I appreciate your straightforward, no-nonsense, pragmatic take on most of his current this current toxic issues. Just want you to know you are loved here in Austin. Your hair looks great today, by the way. Thank you. It's, it's getting grayer, but at least I have the length for now. Yeah, look at this, Mike. I 41. It starts going real gray, real fast. Um, okay, you, you, let's let's wind it up. I think I can't. I mean, I thank you very much. Two hours. Uh, I hope I hope we did good here. I hope everyone enjoyed this. Mike, thank you as always. We'll do it again whenever you want. Whenever there's something good, we didn't. I wanted to talk about a few of the trending issues, but maybe we see how those develop in any event, and we'll we'll get on them later. This is more evergreen too. This is better too, so people can kind of pull it through and yeah, figure out get a little value out of that. Uh, when I when I saw hoaxed and I'm just watching it while I'm jogging on the treadmill, I was like, I need to because I've, I've never done a two hour doc, two hour feature length documentary, and it was it was compelling. I just I, and I had questions and I, right. I knew there was one person to ask. Um, you might stick around. I want to end the broadcast and then you and I will say our farewells. Everybody, thank you very much. Stay well, stay healthy, and see you on the interwebs.